what is what is the job of writing like? I mean, we ha- I had Ian Edwards on here, and he's been in the writers' rooms for like decades. But like, what has your experience been like in the writers' room? My experience in the writers' room has been incredible. But I do have to preface it by saying that every writer's room is very different the way every show operates is different Mm -hmm. so like not just the experience of who you work with but how that room operates it really depends on who's running the room and who you're writing for and with so like our our day is typically 9 30 10 a.m to 6 7 o'clock okay so not crazy hours like i've heard of some writers rooms that go till 11 p.m 2 a.m on some nights doing rewrites and stuff our our writer's room is pretty respectful of our lives outside of it. Like, I still, almost every night, have time to go and do sets after the show. Right. Or after, after the day of work. Um, but it really, it boils down to, like, the way we operate is we typically spend, like, the first two months of... And we have a very long writer's room. We have, like, an eight-month room, which is way longer. Oh, that's above average? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, for, again, it varies. But from my understanding, most shows go for maybe 20 weeks and and we're close to 35 or 40 um Mm. um, but we spend the first few months all in the room together all day planning out the season planning out the story arcs for the episodes and the characters and then once we go into breaking down individual episodes that's when we spend less time collectively and kind of go off into our own offices to work on whatever we specialize in for that episode so it's like a very collaborative effort from the start that can that then gets broken down into different people doing their specialties that's what's beautiful about mrs mazel is like my wife and i got instantly hooked and a big part of that is the writing and when i had beth stelling on here she talked about on crashing they would almost just have tent poles of like okay we want pete and uh his ex-wife's boyfriend to end up in bed together how that happens we don't know but we like they would just set these little like finish lines or checkpoints to hit is that kind of how no ours is the opposite i Uh so i write with um amy sherman paladino and dan paladino who are the creators of the show are Mm -hmm. also the head writers and they are meticulous with their writing and one thing that's different about our show from most other shows is from what i understand most other shows the writers have to be there at the taping and at the filming so if a line doesn't work writers are there to pitch alts on our show the actors and actresses have to be word perfect so like once the script is finalized that's what they're saying there's no like (laughs) there's no this joke isn't working can we get an alt it's like no this is the joke say the joke like our actors and actresses don't miss a the an of a but they are literally word for word word perfect on our script so there's no re- like there's dozens of rewrites before the script is finalized amongst ourselves, but once that script is out, that's the script. Mm. And how do you when you talked about you first kind of beat out the season and then you go into individual episodes? Is it just looking at where we're starting in this season, where we want to end up, and then kind of reverse engineering it? Like how do you build yeah. a story? Yeah, I mean it really comes down to what are we trying to get accomplished for the show and for each character. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know that a big lesson in writing in general is just having a vision. And like, if you know where you're planning on going, it makes everything else fall in line much easier. So obviously Midge is the main character in the show. So her story is the most important, but there's so many different pieces to her world that you kind of map out every character's journey. And that's not to say it's so rigid that like in week one, we're like, this is what happens all season for every character. Things change within the realm of the season, like what we plan on happening. Episode five, when we were writing episode one, might change based on how we kind of reconfigure things as we're going along. But in general, you try to map out each character's journey individually and then what it means in the universe of the show so that it can all kind of come together and work off of each other. And how in terms of writing the show, how much is it bouncing ideas off verbally versus actually like sitting down and putting on the page? Uh, there's a lot of, again, we like, because our show writers and our show runners, the Paladinos, they're like legendary TV writers. So for people that don't know, they met years ago as writers on the original Roseanne. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've gone on, they created the Gilmore Girls. Dan was the show runner for Family Guy for a while. So like, these are, these are like classic TV writers. Right, who, right. It's not like a show where it's their first hurrah and they're kind of feeling out like they know exactly what they want they know what they're doing and amy is very much a boss so it's like it's not one of those writers rooms where everyone comes in equally pitching it's like we all shut the fuck up (laughs) 
<laughs> and listen to what Amy says, and then we listen to what Dan says, and then when they need us, we fill in. The, the, I've, I've given this example one time before. I feel like our writer's room operates a lot like the Chicago Bulls during the Jordan years, where it's like you had Michael Jordan, you had Scottie Pippen, that's Amy and Dan. I just have to be Steve Kerr. You know, like mm -hmm. when they pass me the ball, I need to hit the open jumper and we'll win a championship. I don't need to be Michael Jordan. I don't need to be Scottie Pippen. I just need to do my job when they give me the opportunity to do my job. Um, so so I'm not in there trying to pitch a million jokes a day. It's just like I listen to what they want. And then when I have ideas that are worth sharing, I do it. And that a big lesson for the writer's room that I would say to aspiring writers a lot of it is you're going to be spending 8, 10, 12 hours a day with these people. You need to learn how to get along. Like personalities have to mesh for a show to do well. So as valuable as it is to have good things to say, it's also very valuable to know when to shut the fuck up. Hmm. You know, like hmm. writer's rooms are annoying if there's eight people in there constantly trying to one up each other and get the funniest joke. And sometimes the biggest thing you can do to advance your position in the room is learning how to listen. Especially if you're listening to people who are smarter than you and better at you than what you're trying to do. Do you have any other tips for writers? That's gold, man. Uh, no, I mean, you know, there's like all the cliches of writing, which are cliches for a reason. They're true. Like write what you know, draw on real experience, show, don't tell. Little things like that all matter. But honestly, a, a nugget of wisdom I would say is like if you're ever fortunate enough to be working with great writers and people who have been doing what you hope to do, pay attention. Like... Mm. Take advantage of the situation. Don't be on your phone, you know, checking Twitter and Instagram when, like, you might be missing nuggets of wisdom that will further your career from legendary people around you. And that's got to be gratifying that you booked this writing gig. They saw your stand-up. Yeah. And we're like, and we've got to hire this guy. Well, it was gratifying on, on several levels. So, first of all, the show is about um, a woman who ends up, like, kind of backhandedly falling into the world of stand-up. So they wanted stand-up comedians in the room. And so season one, I went in pretty much as a consultant for the stand-up. But I made myself invaluable in the room because it's also about a Jewish family. And even though Amy Sherman Palladino's father was Jewish, she's not very religious, doesn't know a lot about it. But the family we're writing about are like pretty observant Jews. And even though I was brought in to help with the stand-up, where I was the biggest asset, ended up kind of helping with the Jewish religion stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one of those things where I grew up in a very religious home. And I was always proud of being Jewish, but as you can imagine, any kid being brought up with a lot of religion, like I was also kind of resentful of having so much religion force upon me or like different things that I couldn't do because I had to observe the religion. And then two three decades later so much of my upbringing became the exact reason why i succeed in certain fields so it's like so cool you never know when life experience that you didn't necessarily appreciate growing up will come into play and so it's like i got this job and i'm thriving in this job on a very successful show partly because of stamp but also partly because of the religious foundation my parents gave me that i didn't even really appreciate at the time mm, you're almost so, chosen you could say <laughs> ah nice i yeah. see what you did there <laughs> So yeah, so yeah, I mean, another another piece of advice I would give to writers is just like draw on your life experience. You never know exactly where that experience is going to take you, but like be grateful for whatever upbringing and experience you have because that is what adds to the voice that you can then contribute to a project. So maybe advice for comics, which is a lot of this show, a comic that's wanting to get into a writer's room, what advice do you have for how they can actually get a seat at the table? I mean, honestly, it's it's luck meeting preparation, you know, like you can have writing is incredibly competitive. So many people want to do it and there's only a few spots. So so luck definitely plays a part into it. But when you're lucky enough to have the opportunity, you have to be prepared for that opportunity, which mm. means having your spec scripts, having your pilot scripts, having something to say, um, you know, so it's like you have to do the work when no one's looking to be ready when people are looking is what I would say. Boom. Yes. Mic drop. There you go. And when you say, what'd you say? You said, have your spec scripts, have your pilot. What, yeah. The tangibles they need. Yeah. And, and you more. don't, and you don't know what necessarily they're going to ask for. For those that don't know, a spec script is when you write a script of a show that exists. So like if you were to write 
uh, your version of Modern Family or whatever. You mm -hmm. know, like you write a 30 minute sitcom that people already know. And what that does is it proves that you can write for characters that already exist. It shows that you can mold your voice to a voice of a show and fit in. Because like if you get hired to write on season four of a show that's already been running, those characters already speak a certain way. That world already operates in a certain way. So that's proven that your mind can mold to the universe that's already built in. Mm -hmm. Then a pilot script is your own original idea, and that shows where your voice actually stands out. Um, and so those are two key components of having samples. But again, I got a very high-end writing job that's literally changed my life and didn't even submit a writing packet. That came off of my stand-up. And then more importantly... Like, stand-up is what got me in the room with the Paladinos, but it was my interview that got me the job, and that spoke more to what I was talking about earlier, of just, like, personalities meshing. Yeah, we just talked yeah. for two hours, and they could tell I was a person they could tolerate being around every day in a room. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. But how you write for yourself in stand-up and how you write for these voices, multiple actors on screen, like, yeah. is there? how do you... How do you start to put it through a f different filters like that? Well, it's been crazy because it's not just writing for myself versus multiple characters, but I'm writing for multiple characters who are doing stand up in the 60s. So it's oh, also yeah. like a very <laughs> different style. It's like, um, so what was the question? How do I do that? It's like you almost have to, if, okay, I'm writing for my own personal stand up, I put it through this filter. I'm writing for Midge right now, I put it through this filter. Like you almost have to have all these different voices going on in your head in a sense, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's where part of the skill comes into play mm -hmm. like really good writers can write for other people um and i think for stand-ups who are looking to get into writing one skill that makes stand up stand-ups a great stand-up is being able to open your eyes to other experiences and being able to be empathetic or aware of other viewpoints so that mm -hmm. you can then connect from your own viewpoint to theirs so it's really a matter of stepping outside yourself a little bit and there's a lot of trial and error like I submit a lot of jokes and a lot of storylines that don't get accepted for the show. And then a few do, you know, so like you got to take your shots and just hope that you're putting quality into any of the work that you put forward. And you submitted a lot of to a lot of other shows before actually booking this. Yeah. And, and that's what was so interesting is I submitted probably no lie, 20 to 30 writing packets over the years to other shows that. I always got to the second round or the final round and then ultimately didn't win out, didn't get the job. But that's kind of what I was talking about, of like doing the work while no one is looking to be mm. prepared. It's like if you really want to be a writer, then you have to be willing to spend hours and days and weeks and months doing packets for free that might get you in the room in hopes of one day hitting. You know, it's like you can't be lazy with the shit if you really want it, then you got to be willing to do it. And, and what that means is doing it for free until someone is willing to pay you. And when it comes to a spec script, let's say you're submitting to Modern Family. Do you want to send a spec script about Modern Family or at least a tangential no, you, show? No, you don't. I mean, again, it's like the rules have changed so much and they're constantly dynamic. Of so I, I don't want to be giving advice that is right for one person and wrong for the other. There's no like concrete rules. But mm -hmm. from what I've heard, you don't want to send a script of the show you're trying to write for to that show partly because from a liability standpoint, if they were to end up doing an episode down the road that was similar to your idea, they don't want any kind of confusion or lawsuit of like feeling like they stole your idea. Oh, right. So you want to send a spec script of another show that everyone has seen because, you know, it has to be a popular show so they most likely know the characters in the show you're writing for, but it shouldn't be the show you're trying to write for because that's where there's like a conflict of interest with ideas. Hot breath. Hot breath.